Let's talk about type one. Why don't you have enough insulin? Because in type one diabetes, type one, you have an autoimmune destruction of your beta cells. You destroy your beta cells, you destroy the cells that release insulin, so you don't have enough insulin. This is usually seen in young patients. To, I think the mean age of presentation is like five years old. So really young patients, usually thin, usually doing okay, and then something happens and they destroy their beta cells and don't have insulin, so they have high blood sugar. Okay? So, all right. Autoimmune attack against your beta cells. So you have antibodies against your islet cells, your insulin producing, your beta cells. You can also have antibodies against something called glutamic acid decarboxylase. This is an enzyme that's found in a lot of places. It's found in your pancreas that helps it function. If you knock that off, then you can't function. You can't make your insulin. Something you should know is that because it's autoimmune, there's some relation to um, funky HLA serotypes, especially HLA, DR, three and four, which is seen in white patients that have this. DR7, which is seen in black patients that have type one diabetes, and DR9, which is seen in the Japanese population. Or you know that. That's type one. Type two we said was a good amount of insulin, it just doesn't work. It's, you have insulin resistance. Insulin resistance. <clears throat> what were some causes of insulin resistance? We said things like being obese, things like sedentary lifestyle, and that's the characteristic patient that you'll see. A patient that's obese, tender, sedentary lifestyle, and then you measure their blood sugar and their blood sugar is off the chart. Type two diabetes. Now type two diabetes isn't related to HLAs, not related to autoimmune. However, however, it has a bigger genetic predisposition than type one. Commonly, commonly asked, all right? Commonly asked. And it could be a trick question if you're focused so much on autoimmune HLA and you think, oh, this, this totally has to have a bigger genetic component. No, it's type two that has a bigger genetic component. That's probably the, the biggest trick question you can throw at you. But if you know that, I think you should be good. All right, now how do you diagnose it? You diagnose it with high blood, blood sugar. So you can get the patient to fast. So I'll just write labs. You can get the patient to fast, and then you measure their blood glucose, and if it's high, over 126, you're, you're suspicious, okay? Now, fasting glucose sometimes can be wrong, so we measure it other ways. It's difficult to measure glucose because glucose fluctuates. You eat a lot, you have high glucose, so you don't eat, you have low glucose, right? So it fluctuates. However, we can do something called HbA1c. HbA1c. HP is a type of hemoglobin. This is a type of hemoglobin. So they were, we're measuring red blood cells. Red blood cells. And if you have so much sugar in your blood, then the sugar will bind to this red blood cell. And if you have a ton of these, then you have increased HbA1c. Okay? And the good thing about measuring this is red blood cells live for 120 days or four months. And so we're not measuring you know, constant ups and downs. So we're measuring this, this average over this long time, this average over this long time. And this gives us a better picture of how the patient's blood sugar is over a long time. Um, something you should know, while your red blood cells live for 120 days, not all of them live to that long, yet sometimes they die earlier. And so we kind of split the difference. HbA1c measures three months. Your blood sugar over a period of three months, okay? so. We just kind of cut a month off just, just because we know some red blood cells die. All right, so HbAc, A1c measures it for three months. We can also measure your body's response to sugar. If you have a good functioning pancreas with good insulin response, then anytime you eat sugar, the insulin will be released and suck up that sugar. If you have not enough insulin or poor insulin response, you'll eat that sugar. And then because your insulin's shot, that sugar will stay there and you'll have high sugar. We call that glucose tolerance test. Glucose tolerance. So we'll give 75 grams of glucose and then two, hour late, two hours later we'll draw blood. And if it's still high because it hasn't been sucked up by insulin, if it's over 200 then we know 
and we're suspicious, okay? These are some labs we're gonna do for um, looking for diabetes. A specific lab for type one because you know it's autoimmune, because you know it's antibodies against things, you can look for those antibodies. So in type one, look for antibodies. Things like antibodies against islet cells, things like antibodies against insulin, those are no-brainers. Then of course you have your antibodies against glutamic acid decarboxylic oxalate. So all right, anti-glutamic acid. That's a tricky one because if you see anti-insulin and anti-islet cells, you know, you know that. But they might throw anti-glutamic acid decarboxylase, and you're like, what the heck is that? Type 1 diabetes. Good. Now, <clears throat> diabetes is high blood sugar, right? And we said that's what causes all the complications of diabetes, the chronic complications, the things that in 20 years can happen to you the retinopathy, the blindness, the nephropathy, the chronic kidney disease, the peripheral neuropathy. How does it cause all that? It's just sugar. How does high blood sugar cause all that? Does that through two mechanisms. One is osmotic damage. <laughs> you have too much blood sugar, it draws water into it. And that osmotic damage can, that osmotic drawing of water can damage the vessels. Something, the next method you can have is non enzymatic glycosylation. Glycosylation means putting a sugar on something. Non-enzymatic means you don't need an enzyme to put that sugar on. You have so much sugar, it just latches onto things. Doesn't need an enzyme. You have so much sugar, it'll latch onto everything. It'll latch onto your blood vessels, latch onto your nerves, and cause them to get damaged, cause them to be permeable, cause it to be basically porous and broken and damaged. So it can damage your blood vessels and your nerves. It can damage your small blood vessels, small vessels like those in your eyes and your retina, cause hemorrhage, hemorrhage, all right, retinopathy, hemorrhage. Can damage those in your kidneys, cause nephropathy. I think diabetes is one of, them, if not the most common cause of chronic kidney disease. So it can cause diabetic nephropathy. You've already done renal. Tell me everything you know about diabetic nephropathy. So pause the video, tell me everything you know. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a second. <laughs> Hopefully you're doing this. <clears throat> diabetic nephropathy, we said the early screening test was looking for microalbuminemia, albuminemia, so albumin. Um, what do you see on histology? You see those giant pink nodules. And then how do you treat it? ACE inhibitors, that reduces the, the impact on your kidneys. Was it nephritic or nephrotic? Nephrotic, so proteinuria. Hopefully you were able to recall that. If not, again, don't just learn associations. Think of everything you know about the association. So you should know everything you know about diabetic nephropathy. So these are small vessels. It can also Your large vessels, like your heart, your coronary arteries, you can get an MI. In fact, that's the most common cause of death, all right? Most common cause of death. You have strokes. So that's non-enzymatic glycolysisation. Let's talk about osmotic, osmotic damage. Now, you see high glucose already draws uh, fluid, fluid osmosis, but also, when you have so much glucose, your body will turn it to sorbitol, which is like a holding room for glucose via aldose reductase. And just ask it to chill there as sorbitol until it can use it by turning it into fructose via sorbitol dehydrogenase. All right. However, your lens and your swan cells don't have sorbitol dehydrogenase. So you just have buildup of sorbitol, and sorbitol and the buildup of glucose cause osmotic damage. So your lens gets busted, you get cataracts, you get blindness. Your Schwann cells, your peripheral nerves get busted, you get peripheral neuropathy. All right, that's how high blood sugar causes all these signs that you see in diabetics. Now, these two mechanisms are not uh, mutually exclusive. All right, so osmotic damage can cause these things and non-enzymatic glycolysisation can cause these things, all right? So they work, they're, they're working in tandem. They're both from high blood sugar, all right? So I, I kind of broke things up just to make it simple, but just know they both cause 
the complications of diabetes. Now these are some chronic complications. What are some acute complications? If you go from normal blood sugar to acutely very, very high blood sugar, you can have very acute complications. You can even die. So all right, acute complications of high sugar. Now again, we separate it in type one, type two, type one, type two. They both have high blood sugar. That's the name of the game. However, however, there's a difference. And that difference is the level of glucagon. In type one, we said your insulin is destroyed. You have not enough insulin, so you have low insulin. What happens to your glucagon if you have low insulin? It'll rise. So you have high glucagon. How about type two? What's wrong with your insulin? Do you st Are you still making insulin? Yeah, so insulin's levels here. What does that do to your glucagon? Nothing. Your glucagon will be in normal levels. All right, so this will be normal glucagon. Normal glucagon. And that is very important when we're talking about the acute complications of high blood sugar. See, in type one, in type one, you have high glucagon. And in type one, if you have some sort of acute insult, acute stressor infection or something that blows out your pancreatic, your pancreas cells and cause you to have this acute high blood sugar, you'll have that acute high blood sugar. And that causes osmotic diuresis. So you pee a ton. You pee so much you become hypovolemic. 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 And all this increased glucagon will break down your stores. That's what glucagon does. It will start to break down your stores, your body. It'll break down glucagon, it'll break down glycogen, it'll break down fat and make ketones. Remember your ketones? That's your acetoacetate, which becomes your beta hydroxybutyrate and your acetone. You break all these ketones down and you get ketosis. Ketones are acidic. You get acidosis, acidosis. And the way you compensate for acidosis is you do respiratory compensation. <sighs> Try and breathe out any excess CO2. <sighs> Try and get rid of that acid. <clears throat> so you're breathing out all that and you should know that acetone is volatile, which means it can become a gas. So you're breathing out all that CO2 and you're also breathing out acetone. And you can, and you can smell acetone because it smells fruity. So they'll have this deep breathing, cool, small breathing, breathing out that acetone. You can smell it, it smells fruity. You know the patient is undergoing something we call DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. What a fitting name. That's the acute complication of type one diabetes. Okay, how does it kill you? Whether well, it's a change in water levels, whether it's a change in O2, whether it's a change in CO2, electrolytes, whatever, it causes cere cerebral edema. Cerebral edema. And that is the most common way patients die from DKA. Now, if you draw the labs, draw the labs, in a patient that's coming in with DK, what do you see? Well, you're gonna see hyperglycemia, because that's what we're talking about. You're gonna see metabolic acidosis in particular, anion gap, metabolic acidosis. You're gonna see hyperkalemia. Why do you see hyperkalemia? You see it in your cells, this is your cell, and you're super acidotic. You're making all those ketone bodies, you're super acidotic, and your body says, you know, I gotta do my part, I gotta try and help. And what it does is it'll take in some of this H plus. And it can't just take it in, it'll, that'll mess up his ions. So it'll have to give another positive charge ion in return, so it gives K plus. Now, it's not perfect. It can't take in that much H+, plus, but it's trying to do its job, all right? It's trying to, trying to contribute, trying to help. So it will pump out some K+, plus to try and compensate. And that's what gives you hyperkalemia. Your cells will pump out K+, plus 
and taken H plus. Now, what are the complications? Complications. You can have cerebral edema, the killer, the main killer. You can have arrhythmias from being hyperkalemic. Then you, have, you can have something else, something very important. So let's say a patient goes into DKA and then suddenly complains of severe nasal pain. You look up there, you see black necrosis. You know what I'm hinting at? Mucor mycosis. Mucor mycosis. Mucor mycosis is an opportunistic fungi. Fungi, usually from the genus or the species Rhysippus. And it's opportunistic because it only comes out when you have a lot of feel, a lot of glucose, a lot of ketones in your nose. It thrives on that, loves that, and it'll pop up in your nose and cause black necrosis. Black necrosis is the biggest sign. Black necrosis. How do you treat it? You get your biggest gun, antifungal, amphotericin B, IV, surgical debridement, and then you pray because Mucor has an incredibly, incredibly high death rate, mortality rate. Okay? So you can have Mucor mycosis. That's type one diabetes. Now, how do you treat all this? You can get IV fluid to replace the fluid loss, insulin to take in that sugar, and then potassium. Potassium, that's weird. Why get potassium? We said the patient's hyperkalemic. Are we trying to kill them? No, you see, once you fix the problem, once you fix the acidosis, then your body will say, oh, I'm all set. I, I did my job. Now I can take back in my potassium that I sent out. And you will now become hypokalemic. And hypokalemic can also cause arrhythmias and kill you. So we know that and so we give potassium very, very slowly. Trying to make sure we don't get hypokalemic. All right, that is type one acute presentation. Let's talk about type two. Type two, we said you had normal glucagon and high sugar. The high sugar will give you your osmotic diuresis, your hypovolemia, that's what's gonna kill you. However, because you have normal glucagon, you won't make ketones, you won't make that acidosis, you won't make all that stuff. So if you do labs, labs will show no ketones, will show no acidosis, metabolic acidosis. You just have a ton of high sugar. It will just show massive sugar, like way more sugar than, than usually Type 1 DK, okay, so just massive sugar, and that's causing the diuresis, causing the acute presentation. We call this hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic state, HHS. All right. That's your acute presentation. This is going to be the longest video ever, oh my goodness. But hopefully by the time you're done with this, you know everything there is to know about diabetes, everything to know about pharmacology. That's going to be our next topic, pharmacology. Let's talk about pharmacology. Pharmacology. What's the treatment for type 1 diabetes? They don't have insulin, right? So you replace insulin. What's the treatment for type 2 diabetes? If you said metformin, go to the back of the class because that's not the right answer. The first line treatment of type two diabetes is diet and exercise. <clears throat> we said that diet and exercise upregulates gluten four, takes in that sugar. You can upregulate gluten four so much, you can diet so much, you can exercise so much that you can cure type two diabetes through diet and exercise alone. So why would you even touch drugs? Yeah, why would you even touch all the drugs with the side effects when you just diet, exercise, and cure type two diabetes? And I know what you're saying, you're probably saying, that sounds good in principle, but my patients would never listen. And like 99% of the time, you'd be right. However, it's that one patient that does listen, that does turn their life around, that lives a healthy lifestyle, that makes it all worth it, okay? So type two diabetes, diet, exercise, first line treatment. And if that doesn't work, then you can start thinking about the drugs, okay? Just a, it's a spiel, but very, very important. So let's talk about pharmacology. Type one, you're missing insulin. You can't tell them to diet exercise that they're not making insulin. So type one, you just gotta replace the insulin. 
insulin. There are different types of insulin depending on how fast they work and we need different rates of insulin because I'll tell you why in a second. You have the most rapid acting, rapid acting. This is gonna be your Lispro, your Aspartes, your glucine. So if you draw out a graph of your insulin rates, then these will be super fast acting. Yeah, fast acting as possible. You can have something that's a little less rapid acting, but still very rapid. We'll just say that. We'll say less rapid than that. And that's just your regular insulin. Regular insulin. That will look kind of like this. Good. Got it. So rapid acting will be your LAG. I always just call it LAG. This one will be your normal insulin. You have an intermediate one. Intermediate. So intermediate acting. Call your Neil Patrick Harris insulin. NPH. It's not really called Neil Patrick Harris. It's called, what's it called? It's called neutral protamine hagedorn. You don't need to know that. You just need to know NPH or be able to identify. And then you have slow acting, basal acting called the termer and glargine. So these are slow, these are basal levels. All right, why is that important? So you can have a basal level of insulin and then if you eat and you need increased insulin, you can give rapid acting ones. So you, you're able to manipulate it better, okay? You gotta know all of this, what's rapid, what's intermediate, what's slow, and you should also be able to recognize it in the graph. So I've seen graphs that will just cover up the name, point to a curve, and be like, what's that? Oh, that's intermediate, that's your Neil Patrick Harris insulin. All right, so that's one way to act it, or ask it. Side effects? You can inject insulin and it can work a little too well. Suck up a little bit too much sugar. You get hypoglycemic. What happens if they OD? How can you tell they OD from insulin? Check your CPAP diet, absolutely right. Another side effect, when you inject it into the injection site, uh, it can suck in, sugar suck in, all that, and increase fat stores, which is what it's supposed to do. And it can cause um, abnormal adipose. We call that, we call that, lipodystrophy and in that injection site you'll see kind of this abnormal dimpling this abnormal fat tissue around that site and we call that lipodystrophy okay a good picture will be in my notes so that's type one give them insulin type two we said diet exercise but if that doesn't work we can give them oral drugs let's talk about our oral drugs Anytime I talk about farm, I like to draw out the pathway first. That way, if I see the pathway, then I know, okay, I can manipulate it this way, this way, that way, to, to listen to effect. And if you draw out the pathway of any pathology, then it makes learning pharmacology a lot easier. So let's just redraw our pathway that we, we learn. It's like I'm trying to make this video longer. I'm not. This is turning out to be a very long video. So we said our first step was you eat a lot of sugar. Yeah, and the sugar gets digested into your body. Sugar. And we said sugar can either be polysaccharides or mono. We said poly gets broken down by brush border enzymes like alpha glucosidase. Yeah, and that gets transported into your pancreatic beta cells. Pancreatic beta cells. Where calcium can influx and release insulin. But we said we don't want to release insulin willy nilly, so we have a potassium channel that constantly efflux, yeah? And that kind of stops its release. But we said sugar will come in, glute two, find that potassium channel, stop it, and we're able to release insulin, right? And then insulin comes out with its insulin buddies, its insulin buddies, things like amylin, things like glucagon-like peptide, Things like gastric inhibitory peptide. These were called incretins, remember? And after it did its job, it got broken down by DDDPP4. And insulin went into the cells, did its job, made GLUT4, 
and also induced um, the making of lipids, making of glycogen. And after it did its job, any excess glucose that wasn't sucked up by GLUT4 <coughs> would go to your kidneys, kidneys, where if need be, it will be reuptaked by SGLT2. That's the pathway. Not too bad. Let's talk about the pharmacology. So, looking at the pharmacology, looking at the pathway, we'll just start from the beginning. We can stop this breakdown of the polysaccharides by alpha glucosidase by blocking alpha glucosidase. This is going to be a carbose, drugs like a carbose, drugs like maglitol. And it'll block it from breaking down the mo other monosaccharides and getting reabsorbed. So you get a little less sugar into your body. A little helps with your diabetes, helps with your high blood sugar. Okay. Some side effects. You can have diarrhea. You can have gas because you won't be able to reabsorb it so it stays in your gut and you get osmotic diarrhea and you kind of poo it out. So gas, diarrhea. You should also know that your monosaccharides are reabsorbed in the same rate because alpha only works in your poly, your mono reabsorbed in the same rate. Next up, our next step was releasing insulin, right? If we have high blood sugar, then we want to release more insulin, suck up that sugar. We can do this with sulfonylureas. Sulfonylureas. These are going to be drugs like gliparide and glipizide. And what they do is they bind to this potassium channel. Stop it. That way you can depolarize, release insulin. All right, so it has to work on your pancreatic beta cells. Will it work in type 1 diabetes? Do you have beta cells in type 1 diabetes? No, they're, they're autoimmune destroyed. All right, so this won't work in type 1 diabetes. Some side effects, it can, it can work a little bit too well. It can suck in a little bit too much glucose. You can have weight gain. So, right, side effect, weight gain. It can suck in glucose a little too well. You get hypoglycemia. You overdose on sulfonylureas, and you have way too much insulin. What do you check? C peptides. Will C peptides be increased? Yes, because you're releasing it normally. So you're also releasing C peptide. Another drug that works on this pathway is going to be your meclindonide. Meclindonide. These all in in glenide. Meclindonides do the exact same thing. They will block this potassium channel. But they just work on a different site. All right. So all right, same as sulfonylurea, but different site. Different site. Let's move on to our next step. We release insulin. We also release our insulin buddies, right? Release our insulin buddies. We had amylin, we had GLP, GIP, and those were called incretins, broken down by DPP4. You can already guess what we're going to do. We're going to give amylin analogs, like pramilinotide. Pramilinotide. We're going to give GLP mimetics, like Write it down here. Ozanatide and itroglutide. Side effect, it can cause pancreatitis. It seems to be toxic to the pancreas. It was originally isolated from Gila monsters. Those are those venomous monsters, those little reptiles. And so I guess they haven't isolated or purified it enough. It still causes pancreatitis. Another way we can work on this step, we can block DPP4. By blocking DPP4, we have our incretins. They, they, they're no longer destroyed. We can have increased incretins. So DPP4 inhibitors include your gliptins. So these all end in gliptins. 
You see a drug ending in glyptins is a DPP4 inhibitor, right? Side effects of which it can cause urinary and respiratory infections. Why does that? Not quite sure, but just know that anything that ends in glyptins is your DPP4 inhibitors and they cause urinary and respiratory infections, okay? Let's go to our next step. Insulin, working on the cells, doing its job, increasing GLUT4, eliciting a response. That will be our next step. And these drugs are called insulin sensitizers. They make insulin do its job better. This is great for um, people that are insulin resistant, like type 2 diabetes, where insulin doesn't do its job. The most common drug and the most widely used diabetic drug is going to be metformin. AKA by guanide. It increases insulin sensitivity. Also decreases hepatic gluconeogenesis. Stops your liver from making more glucose. That way you don't increase your blood sugar anymore. So it stops your liver from making more glucose. Because it doesn't work on the pancreas, you can give it with type 1 diabetics. And that way they kind of don't have to take as much insulin, don't have to inject themselves as much. That's, that's a good sign. So it can be used with type 1 diabetics because it doesn't work on the pancreas. In fact, no one really knows how it works. It kinda, they know it works really well, they just don't really know the exact mechanism. It can also cause weight loss. And it is euglycemic. It doesn't seem to cause you to be hypoglycemic. Okay, so if you accidentally take an extra dose, you're not going to see your blood sugar plummet. So it's euglycemic. Now, there's not without side effects. The main side effect is lactic acidosis. Lactic acidosis. Why does it cause lactic acidosis? Because your liver makes glucose from lactate. Takes lactate, makes glucose. However, we said we block that pathway, and so it can no longer use lactate to make glucose. So lactate rises, rises, rises. You get lactic acidosis. So the way we excrete lactate is we excrete it renally. And so you don't give metformin in people that are that have renal failure. All right. Also, don't give it in people that have respiratory failure. Why is that? Because <clears throat> if you can't breathe, you have acidosis. Yeah, you have increased lactate, so that just causes the lactic acid to build up more. All right, so renal and rest failure, don't give it to them. I swear we're almost done, all right? <laughs> we have another drug that works on the insulin sensitivity pathway called thiazolidinidone. Thiazolidinidone. And these all end in glitazone. These increase insulin sensitivity. Okay, so they bind, they go into the cell and they bind this nucleus receptor called peroxisome proliferator, peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma. It'll be in my notes, I'm not gonna write it all out, but P, P, A, R, Y, which you should be able to recognize. And that increases your insulin ability to work. Increases to your GLUT4. So it increases GLUT4. Because it takes place in the nucleus, increases transcription. It takes a little while to work. So all right, takes a while. So don't expect anything drastic right away. Then side effects, for whatever reason, seems to retain a lot of water. Patients seem to retain a lot of water. So. Do not give it in the patients with heart failure. All right, because it can retain water, exacerbate that heart failure. So let's say a patient is type two diabetic, taking something glitazone, um, and starts to complain of shortness of breath. What happened? They're retaining fluid. They're exacerbating heart failure if they have heart failure. Okay, that's one of the way to ask it. And then last but not least, we're at the end. Our last step, any excess glucose goes to your kidneys and if need be, you reabsorb it. You reuptake it via SGLT2 transporter. We can block that. 
That way you don't reabsorb it, that way you keep your blood sugar low. We block that with drugs that end in gliflosin, kind of like flow. I always remember it as some like flow, like the flow of urine. So gliflosin, and you block that and you'll pee out more sugar. And you're not gonna be able to reabsorb the sugar, you're not gonna be able to use the sugar, but bacteria sure like it. So side effects include things like UTI. And because you're peeing so much, you can throw off your electrolyte balances and get hyper Kalimic, all right? That's the pharmacology of diabetes. Hope that clears things up. Thanks.